Hello, it's Elise Corbin, Conservation Education Coordinator for Peter Francisco Soil and Water Conservation District, serving Buckingham and Cumberland Counties. What you're looking at right here is a soil community biorama, and it's comprised of critters that you would find in the soil. And we're gonna just zoom in on each one and talk about them. So number one, we have topsoil. And topsoil is the upper, outermost layer of soil. It's usually two to eight inches thick. It contains organic matter, the highest concentration that you'll find in soil. And it has microorganisms in it, things that you can only see with a microscope, organisms. And it's where most of the Earth's biological soil activity occurs. Number two, this is your club, um, clay subsoil layer. Clay holds mineral nutrients and retains water better than other soil types. For these reasons, it can be very beneficial to, for plants to grow in this type of soil. It doesn't drain very quickly. However, which can be problematic after heavy rains, but it helps with disallowing nutrient leaching as the water drains through the soil. A soil is considered a clay if its makeup is comprised of 40% or more clay particles. Clay particles help hold the other two types of soil, silt and sand together in any given soil's makeup. Clay particles carry a negative charge and are smaller and have more surface area than all other types of soil particles. Most minerals are positively charged and so are naturally attracted to the negative charge of the clay particles. The large surface area helps more minerals adhere to clay particles. Clay attracts silt and sand as well to create a complete soil. The large surface area helps more minerals adhere to the clay particles. Let's see. Clay soils compact easily and they can be difficult to dig and do not drain water very quickly. Wet soil with a heavy clay content will compact into a muddy soil ball if squeezed. The ball will not fall apart. Wet clay soil is also very sticky to the touch. The higher a percentage of clay particles in a soil, the more resistant that soil is to pH level changes. Number three, this is a sand subsoil. And a sand particles are granular soils that contain small rock and mineral particles. The soil feels coarse, whether it's dry or wet. Sand particles have the largest pore space of the three soil particles, allowing water to run quickly through it so plant roots can more easily get oxygen and nutrients. It buffers the acids that are produced by decomposing plant and animal matter, and by virtue of the acids that react with it, provides trace minerals for plants. Sand also provides weight and serves as a matrix, which helps to strengthen and stabilize the soil mix so that the larger plants and trees don't fall over at the slightest breeze. Number four, this would be a best beetle. Best beetles live in hardwood logs, munching away on the tough tree fibers and turning them into new soil. They prefer oak, hickory, and maple, but will set up shop in just about any hardwood log that has sufficiently decayed. Number five is a millipede. Millipedes are nature's litter recyclers. They are detritivorous, which means they feed on dead plants and animals. They're snacking recycled nutrients back into the soil at a much faster rate than plants and animals decomposing naturally. Ranging in size from a quarter to even 15 inches long, millipedes play a large role in breaking down nature's waste. Millipedes do not have a thousand legs. A hatchling is born with only three pairs of legs and can grow up to 200 pairs of legs in an adult. Number six, let's zero in on number six. So number six, Lichens are not plants. They are composite organisms made up of two tiny living things, a fungus and an algae. The fungus and the alga benefit from living together. The alga produces food and the fungus gathers water. In this way, a lichen can survive harsh weather that would kill a fungus or an alga growing alone. This type of relation, chip, is called symbiosis. Lichens are bioindicators of high quality air in the environment. The more three-dimensional the lichens are, the better the air quality. 
They not only convert carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into oxygen through algal photosynthesis, but they absorb everything in their atmosphere, especially pollutants. Lichens grow on the bark of most trees. When it rains, they act as a sponge by absorbing as much water as possible. After the rain stops, they slowly release the water back into the environment. This process keeps humidity levels in the forest more stable than if the water was simply allowed to fall directly onto the ground. Lichens also grow on rocks. Many lichens contain acids that help break down rock into soil. Furthermore, the mechanical action of the fungal threads of the lichen penetrating the spaces between the rock crystals together with changes in temperature and moisture also help break down rock into soil. Number seven, the click beetle. Click beetles got their names from the clicking noise they make. Adult click beetles feed on leaves, plants, nectar, pollen, and sometimes aphids. Female click beetles mate with adult males and lay eggs in the soil during the summer months. Eight, this is a wild onion. Wild onions are edible and used in herbal medicines or tonics. You can see the beetle larva feeding on its roots in this biorama, which brings us to number nine, which is the click beetle. There's the adult one. This is the click beetle in its larval state. So they're called wireworms when they're in the larval state. Although some species complete their development in one year, wireworms usually spend three or four years in the soil, feeding on decaying vegetation and the roots of plants and often causing damage to agricultural crops like potatoes, strawberries, corn, and wheat. The subterranean habits of wireworms, their ability to quickly locate food by following carbon dioxide gradients produced by plant material in the soil, and their remarkable ability to recover from illness induced by insecticide exposure, sometimes after many months, make it hard to exterminate this little critter. Wireworms can pass easily through the soil on account of their shape and their process and the propensity for following pre-existing burrows. They can travel from plant to plant, thus injuring the roots of multiple plants within a very short time. Number 10. Now, number 10 is a little, little thing here. It's a sow bug. Sow bugs are not insects, but they're terrestrial crustaceans. And many of us have called them roly polies or pill, or, uh, you know, because they kind of roll up into a little ball when you touch them. These uh, terrestrial crustaceans have gills. Like crabs and other crustaceans and females, they carry their eggs in pouches, and baby sow bugs live in the pouch for several days before venturing out into the world. They do not urinate. Instead, they pass ammonia gas directly through their exoskeleton. They drink water from both ends and even eat their own poop to recycle the copper that they excrete. Humans have iron in their blood, which causes our blood to appear red. When oxidized, crustaceans have copper in their blood, so it appears blue when oxygen gets to it. During daylight, sow bugs spend their hours in moist, dark areas, and when nighttime comes, they're active in eating deco decomposing organic matter. So there we have the sow bug. Now, number 11. This little fella is a very interesting fellow. It's called a carrion beetle. Listen to this. It's a warm midsummer night. Two creatures find a small dead animal and begin to bury it underground by gradually excavating the soil out from underneath it. Once it falls in the underground chamber, the creatures strip the fur or feathers from the carcass, roll it into a ball, and coat it with secretions, preserving it into a semi-mummified state. Then they mate. Later, the carcass will be food for the entire family. A scene from Stephen King's latest novel? Mm -mm. These creatures are carrion beetles, also commonly known as burying beetles, and they are one of nature's most efficient and fascinating recyclers. These beetles feed off the decaying flesh of dead animals, which is Anything that's dead is called carrion. Dead animals are called carrion. That's where they get their name from. So let's see, and they also eat decaying vegetation. 
carrion beetles recycle carcasses, ultimately returning valuable nutrients into the soil. In addition, this beetle might be an indicator species, or one that tells us whether or not the environment is healthy. Burrowing beetles are unusual in that both the male and female take part in raising their young. Male burrowing beetles often locate carcasses first and then attract a mate. Beetles often fight over the carcass, with usually the largest male and female individuals winning. The victors bury the carcass, the pair mates, and the female lays her eggs in the adjacent tunnel. Within a few days, the larvae develop, and both parents feed and tend to their young, an unusual activity under, among insects. Their brood size usually ranges from 30 to 1 but 12 to 15 is the average size of the children that these have. The larvae spend about a week feeding off the carcass, then crawl into the soil to pupate or develop. Mature American burying beetles emerge from the soil 45 to 60 days after their parents initially bury the carcass. Adult American burying beetles only live for 12 months. All right, so next we have number 12. And this is a beech nut. Beech trees begin producing seeds around 40 years old, and by 60, they can produce large amounts of seeds. They don't produce every year and can cycle from two to eight years. In northern and central states, the beech flowers in late April or early May, when the new leaves are about one third grown. They're quite vulnerable to spring frost though. The seeds ripen between September and November. Two to four nuts are usually found in one burr. Heavy frost can cause the burr to open and drop its seeds. There are about 1,600 seeds to a pound. Beech seeds, also called mast, are sought after by a large variety of birds and mammals, including mice, squirrels, chipmunks, black bear, deer, foxes, ruffed grouse, ducks, and blue jays. Number 13, check this out, another type of beetle. This is a caterpillar hunter beetle. This is the largest and most attractive beetles in North America. Like many other ground beetles, it prefers to hunt at night and by day can be found hidden away under rocks, logs, and other debris. However, unlike most ground beetles, they often climb trees in search of their favorite prey, which are caterpillars. This habit has earned it the common name caterpillar hunter. The caterpillar hunter beetle life begins as an egg laid singly in the soil. Larvae are predatory as well and are active hunters. The larvae eventually burrow back into the soil to pupate. Adults may then live for as long as two to three years. Let's come over here and check out this, number 14. Number 14 are mushrooms. Mushrooms are reproduced structures of fungi and may indicate healthy soil for trees and other plants to grow in. Fungi and bacteria play an integral role in the earth. They break down complex organic compounds of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats into the most basic elements that can be used by other generations of organisms. Plants don't have mouths or stomachs. They rely on soil fungi and bacteria to digest the nutrients for them. In return, they feed soil organisms with sugars that make they make in photosynthesis. Now down here, number 15, you see those light strands of white stuff coming from the mushroom? This is called mushroom mycelium. They are thread-like networks or clusters of hyphae. Some attach the two plant roots, creating filaments that reach far into the soil increasing the surface area of plant roots up to a thousand times. Fungal hyphae and plant roots work together, and this is called mycorrhizae. And many native and landscape plants depend on this relationship for optimal health and growth. A thimble full of soil can contain miles of mycorrhizae filaments. The mycorrhizae filaments of fungi produce organic compounds that glue soils together and improve the structure and porosity to enhance root growth. In addition, mycorrhizae in the soil suppresses soil-borne pathogens and protect plants from root diseases. Most plants, grasses, fruit, and nut trees depend on some type of fungal activity. Number 16, 
two little tiny eggs. Guess what they are? Grasshopper eggs. Grasshoppers mate in late summer and during fall. About two weeks later, females begin to deposit clusters of eggs in the soil. During this process, a glue-like secretion cements soil particles around the egg mass, forming a protective pod. Each pod might contain 25 to 150 eggs, depending on the species of the grasshopper. So we see two pods right here. Grasshoppers, which deposit masses containing few eggs, usually lay more pods to compensate for this. Ideally, each female may produce 300 eggs. The eggs spend the winter in the soil and hatch throughout April, May, and June as soil temperatures rise and spring rains begin. The first nymph to leave the egg pod makes a tunnel from the pod to the soil surface through which the rest of the nymphs emerge. Nymphs feed and grow for 35 to 50 days, molting five or six times during this period. Development proceeds most rapidly when the weather is warm and not too wet, so grasshoppers help aerate the soil. Let's go to number 17. And these, uh, there we go, are really small eggs. They're cluster fly eggs. The cluster fly eggs are laid singly in the su summer and they're deposited into cracks in the soil where they will hatch within three days. Number 18 just below it. After they hatch, they go to their larval state. So this is the cluster fly larva. The maggots that emerge then embed themselves inside of an earthworm. And there they complete their larval stage, which lasts between 13 and 22 days. Number 19, let's look down here below this mouse. And you see right there, that's fly pupa. The pupal stage lasts between 11 to 14 days. This process will repeat itself for four generations each summer. Cluster flies are about the size of a house fly and usually live outside during warm weather months. Feeding off flowers and fruit. As the cooler fall, or fall weather approaches, cluster flies find their way into buildings through small cracks and crevices. Once inside, the fly hides in clusters and ride out the winter until spring. That's where they get their name. Number 20 is a mouse in a burrow. You see the little tunnel, his burrow? Mice are hardy creatures. They are found nearly every country in the world and every type of terrain. Mice typically make a burrow underground if they live out in the wild. They like to eat fruit, seeds, and grains. They are omnivorous, which means they eat both plants and meat. Number 21, we just got a little glimpse of that before. That's the earthworm. There are 2,700 different kinds of earthworms. An earthworm has no arms, legs, or eyes. They tunnel deeply into the soil and bring subsoil closer to the surface, mixing it with topsoil. Slime, a secretion of earthworms, contains nitrogen, which is an important nutrient for plants. The slime also helps to hold clusters of soil particles together to form aggregates. Earthworms eat bacteria, fungi, and protozoa in the soil, as well as organic matter like decaying plants and animals. Worms take in oxygen through their skin, so it has to stay moist. They will die if they dry out, and they'll drown if there's too much water. That is why you see a lot of worms surface after a rain. An earthworm is equipped with both male and female reproductive organs, so they are hermaphrodites. hermaphrodites. Worms mate by joining their clitella and exchanging sperm. Each worm then forms an egg capsule. Babies hatch from cocoons smaller than a grain of rice. Earthworms have the ability to replace or replicate lost segments. They can eat their weight each day. Let's go over to number 22. This 
is the sphinx moth pupa. The sphinx moth is found worldwide. They hide during the day and emerge at dusk or during the early morning hours, drinking nectar from flowers. Females lay as many 1,000 eggs on leaves, which hatch in two to three days into a caterpillar. The green caterpillar, with pointed horn on its rear end, leaves a uh, eats leaves and stems from plants. Then it burrows into the ground to pupate over winter and hatch out in early summer. In warmer and tropical regions, it only takes two to three weeks to hatch out of the ground, and many generations are produced each year. And the final critter that is in this is this little fellow over here by the mushrooms. Let's see if we can get a closer look at him. Number 23. He's a dung beetle. Now this is a fascinating creature. Our North American species are seldom more than an inch in length. You can see how small it is. They possess a sort of brush-like sieve mouth parts for slurping wet dung. And you know what dung is? Poop, right? Animal poop? Uh, let's see. Males often possess a horn or tooth-like projection on their back. The majority of dung beetles consume manure produced by herbivores. Those are plant-eating animals like horses and cattle. Within hours from the manure being dropped, the beetles migrate to a pile and start working on it. Within 24 hours, you can see, visibly see how beetles have been working on the pile by pulling the 100% organic dung into tunnels that they have created in the soil below where they lay eggs, which will start the next generation of dung beetles. In just a few days, all the remains of the original pile of dung is material that looks like peat moss, and the material is safe to use directly in the garden. So this is a look at a soil community biorama where you can see there are all kinds of critters in the soil. And these are the ones that we can see. But there's in a handful of healthy soil, there are mil thousands and millions of unseen critters, which you can look at in a video that's along with that, that you'll see uh, along with in this, if you just click on the next one of the next videos. I hope you have a blessed day and uh, enjoy looking at the critters found in our soil. Remember, soil is very amazing and may be the cornerstone of life on Earth.